If you're new with us this morning, I hope you weren't overly mauled. But we do uh, a fairly good job of welcoming folks here. We love to do that. Even though we realize it's kind of a, it can be uncomfortable if you're a first-time guest, but we want you to know uh, life at the journey is, uh, it's real life, and we do it together. Uh, And that's a, a really high priority and value for us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get uh, very far down the road this morning. Father, we come to you this morning in the name of your resurrected Son, Jesus. He is our King. He has a name that is higher than every name. And at his name, Lord, our hearts, our whole posture, Lord, bows before him. And we submit to him that he is master and commander of our lives. That he is brother and friend. And that you are loving father, protector, and caregiver for us, your people. Lord, we ask too that you might send the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, would come and be with us this morning and that He would help us to understand things that we won't grasp without his help. So we ask that he would open the eyes of our heart. God, that even our emotions would just kind of get cut and laid bare before you this morning. That we would just kind of sit before you today as as raw people. uh, Ready for you to do work on our hearts. In our minds, our emotions, and our will, Father God. So that we might leave here having had, the full, having had the whole person addressed by your word. And that in worship, we would go out different people. We love you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you. Well, I think I do know about you, actually, more than you think. Uh, failure is something that often just kind of saps us of strength. You know, whenever you've tried to succeed at something over and over and over again, and you've failed over and over and over again, what do you begin to lose? Hope. Confidence. You lose confidence, you lose hope, and and anybody who's ever played sports at any kind of team level knows that, man, when you lose your confidence... It's really, really hard to get it back. Major League Baseball players go, uh, you know, 0 for 20, and man, they just start losing their confidence and their hope that they're ever going to hit again. Uh, And so we know how failure kind of saps us of strength, how it saps us of confidence. And there are a lot of stories out there. In fact, they're our favorite stories to read about those people who have failed greatly whether it be in sports or in some other aspect of life, and yet they kind of rebounded and they became way even better than they were to begin with. We love those stories of renewal, those stories of restoration, those stories of recovery. Those are some of our favorite stories, but if we're honest sometimes, we feel like those stories are beyond us. Like we failed one too many times, whether it's in relationships, whether it's in friendships, whether it's as a good neighbor, whether it's in our marriage, uh, whether it's at our job, whatever it is, we, we can feel like we failed so many times that these great stories of recovery are a little bit just beyond us. Well, the good thing is that the Bible is for people who fail. The Bible is for people who fail. The The people who seem to win all the time, it's like they're always succeeding at everything. They never seem to fail. Those are the people who really find it difficult to resonate with the Bible. Because the Bible is all about people who failed often and miserably. I mean, think about, uh, you know, Abraham, who God chooses him, calls him to be the father of a great nation, uh, and in the space of a few years tries to pass his sister, or tries to pass his wife off as his sister twice, because he's afraid of getting harmed by the local king. Uh, And then he tries to circumnavigate God's plan for an heir by sleeping with his handmaid, 
to produce an heir. And this is one of the great heroes of faith that Hebrews 11 and other passages of Scripture speak a great deal of. Think about Jacob, whose name was, uh, whose name actually meant deceiver. That's what his name meant. How would you, hi, my name's, this is my son, his name means deceiver. Um, Jacob tried to, of course, with the help of his mother, deceive his father into giving him the blessing that his brother, his older brother, was entitled to. And he succeeded in doing that. Think about Moses, whose first real recorded act was to kill somebody. And then to run away into the desert where he would hide for 40 years. This is one of the individuals that the Jewish uh, rabbis and teachers in the New Testament would speak so highly of. And it was in him that they put all of their confidence. All of these people were failures. But the people who seem to succeed and win at everything, they don't resonate real well with this. They'll never really see their need for God. They seem to be, in their eyes, doing a pretty good job on their own. Well, we have a great deal of stories in Scripture. Those people who turned out to be leaders of God's people who were great, uh, colossal failures. The Bible records God's working in their lives to show us that from every failure, there is a possible recovery. That from every failure, there is a possible renewal. That people who fail greatly can be remade in a new image. That they can, in fact, become different people. All recovery of broken failings in the Old and the New Testaments come from one source. One source. The source is the most powerful event of all time. And that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We can think of God creating the world with words spoken and whole worlds, a universe comes into existence with billions of planets and stars. And and those things pale in comparison to the fact that... uh, the. The Son of God took death by the throat and conquered it. Once and for all, for all of those people who would, by faith, trust in Him. All restoration stems from Christ's resurrection from the dead. All renewal stems from this resurrection. All repair, all recovery, it all has its source in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What looked like abject failure on the cross on Friday had accomplished the greatest success the world has ever known. And that's the recovery of the human race from total ruin. You see, what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden put us in a very, very bad way. When we try to describe and explain the depths of total depravity, the fact that we are dead in transgressions and in sins, we can't even uh, really wrap it up in words to explain the destitute place that we were in. And Jesus took it on himself to repair our condition. If you're here this morning and you're not very sure about the whole Jesus thing, I hope to give you a reason to believe today. I think the Bible is full of reasons to believe. I won't spend any time, really, on the historical proofs of the resurrection. If you want to hear about some of those, I can share those with you at length. But what I hope this morning is to simply help you see a vision for a life infused with God's power. I believe that life is possible. I believe that the Christian life is a life infused with inexhaustible power due to the actual historical resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Through his work, the failures of believing sinners are forgiven and forgotten. Through Christ's resurrection, the weakness of our failures gets swallowed up by an intimate sort of power. This is Christ's power for the reclaiming of our lives. So I would ask you, do any of you need this? Do you need restoration in any area of your life? Do you need renewal in any of your relationships? Does your marriage 
need an infusion of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in it. Mine does. Mine does. Do you have broken places in your life that they need the very finger of God to touch and heal? Well, this morning I want us to look at what just might be the most incredible story of healing in the entire Bible. I think we need to hear it. So here goes the story. Long, long ago in a land far, far away, there lived an actual historical figure who was pretty much a nobody. He wasn't on anyone's radar. He'd been passed over for any kind of position or prestige He had no identity with which to speak of. His life might have been fairly uneventful except for a meeting he had with another very real historical uh, figure, a, a Jewish teacher, an emerging Jewish teacher. This guy was just a fisherman, like I said, a nobody. And his name would have never been recorded and we would not know anything about him or anything that he ever said except for this meeting with a man who told him at his boat, Come, follow me, and I'll make you to fish for men. Over the next several years, he followed this Jewish teaching figure who was a very polarizing individual. Some people really loved him and others really, really hated him. And he followed this man for several years. Jesus, who was the teacher, called 12 men to follow him, but this one fisherman he called into the inner circle of three. This nobody had privileged access, and he would get to see things that only a couple of other individuals would ever get to see. On one particular day, he saw the teacher glorified. And the, the idea of glorified, if you will, in this text is to say that This individual got to see Jesus in such a way that there isn't even an ounce of doubt. Not even an ounce of doubt that he was the Son of God. He even said as much later on. He got to see Jesus in in a way that you and I long to see Jesus because all of us live, don't we, with varying degrees of doubt. Aren't we all inclined to, see, to say and pray and cry out to God, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief? Because we do have those times of doubt. We do go through those extreme situations and we doubt. But this man was able to see something that left no doubt. Imagine getting to see Jesus go pretty much radioactive with the Father's glory and be able to hear God the Father speak from heaven, this is my son. Listen to him. You may have already guessed by now who I'm talking about. Any guesses? Peter. Peter. From fisherman to the inner circle of the Son of God. From nobody to traveling with the one who created the world. Later on, as he was following Jesus, Jesus began to say some some pretty dark things. Things like, I'm going to suffer greatly and be put to death by crucifixion. Now, It seems like everything is flowing towards a really great direction. He thinks this Jewish teacher is going to take his spot on the throne and he's going to rid Israel of Roman oppression and they're going to go back to the glory days and it's going to be great. And then he starts talking like this. So you can imagine how Peter must have processed some of that. He probably had to think, you know, Jesus is getting a little tired. His schedule is exhausting. I mean, who can keep up with this kind of activity? Maybe we need to scale back on his schedule a little bit. At one point, Peter even rebukes Jesus when he's talking this dark kind of talk. Later, when Jesus talks like this again, Peter would say that he would fight to the death with him. 
Everybody might leave you, Jesus, but not me. I'll stick with you to the end. I'll absolutely never turn my back on you. Then when Jesus was in the gravest of danger, when everyone seemed to have run away in fear, what did Peter do? He denied he knew him three times. So vehemently that he's cursing and swearing. I swear to you, I do not know this man. As Jesus has to hear all of the mockers around him during that time, Peter's voice, his in, one of the inner three, that denial had to ring the loudest. After the third denial, the scripture says in Matthew 26 that Peter went away and wept bitterly. And the word for bitterly there in that text simply means that Peter went away and had enormous agony of mind and emotion. Enormous agony. Have you ever been crushed by guilt before? Have you ever felt enormously guilty for something? Have you ever got to the point where literally you, you felt like you couldn't hardly breathe anymore? It was so intense. The guilt and the shame was so enormous. Now imagine denying three times the Lord of the universe that you even know him or have walked with him. I can't imagine what the next three days were like for Peter. I I just, Jesus is arrested. He's beaten beyond recognition. He dies on the cross. Peter has to be suffering enormous guilt as he, his Lord goes to a grave and everything goes so completely dark, so completely black, if you will, in his life. And there seems to be no hope. Shame and guilt are strangling him to death. This is the kind of thing, when you do this kind of thing, it's quite often the the thing that you never come back from. You you never come back from. These are the kinds of things that begin to identify the soul of a person. And they slink away in shame and in guilt, never to be heard from or seen again. He's utterly devoid of any hope whatsoever. Guilt threatens to dismantle him at his core. Can you imagine all the if-only scenarios that went through Peter's mind? If only I hadn't ran away. If only I had stood by him. If only I'd been faithful. If only I hadn't denied him. We all know about guilt. Now open your Bibles to John chapter 21. We've taken a long time to get to the text. So just imagine, as we get to this text, imagine what Peter has been suffering with. Imagine the failure, the sense of failure that is absolutely killing him probably threatening to drive him insane. John chapter 21, verse 1, Jesus appears to seven of his disciples. It says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself, I think this is important, he revealed himself in this way. He wants us to understand something about the revelation of the resurrected Jesus. So he reveals himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. He's going to go back to the only thing he knows how to do. It's what he did before Jesus came along. It's the only thing he knows how to do, to go back into that life of just being marginalized, that place place of being uh, not remembered, not recognized, not noticed. I'm I'm going to go fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. 
they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, you know, I'm just, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, if I'm Peter, you know what I'm doing? I'm ducking to the lowest part of the boat. I mean, whenever we've wronged someone so greatly, so enormously, are we usually seeking those people out? Or are we hiding? Guilt threatens to crush him, and yet he throws himself out of the boat. When he heard it, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon went uh, went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Now, there are a lot of significant things in this passage of Scripture. The thing that I want to dwell on the most is the fact that Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? Do you see any significance in three times? Yeah, it's kind of hard to miss that. Uh, Basic Bible students are going to see that Peter denied Jesus three times. Three times Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Once for every time that Peter failed his Lord. Let me explain what I think Jesus is doing here. Peter's denials the night of Jesus' arrest, like I said, they're the type of thing that threaten to define you forever. You become the guy. You become the guy who denied Jesus three times, and that gets written on your tombstone. That's the thing that you get remembered by. You get remembered by all of your failure, all of your brokenness, the, the most prominent episodes where you really blew it. It's this sort of failure that threatens to arrest you in your guilt and shame. So you just slink away. So what does Jesus do? <laughs> he rubs Peter's nose in his failure. Really, that's what he's doing. I've heard commentators try to explain different aspects of this, but 
He's rubbing Peter's nose in his failure. But you need to know his purpose is a healing purpose. Not a crushing purpose. Not a bruising purpose. Not a condemning purpose. You see, it's through facing our failures so completely. It's through facing them so completely that we can experience the grace of Jesus in a transforming kind of way. Jesus would radically remake Peter. What's Peter doing at the beginning of this episode? He's going back to fish. He's returning back to an old life of no recognition, not doing anything significant or important in the way that God had called him to do. Jesus said years ago, I'll make you fishers of men rather than fishers, fishing for men. He's just going to go back and fish for fish. But Jesus is going to remake Peter. And Peter has to thoroughly understand the fact that Jesus' forgiving grace extends to someone as bad as him. He needs to know that someone who has blown it on the, the, this cosmic scale of denying the Lord and creator of the universe, he needs to know that the grace of God and forgiveness extends to that. So what is it what what is there in your life that you've screwed up so badly you've broken so badly that you failed at so miserably and you think the resurrected lord can't touch it and heal it Jesus wants Peter to know you're not benched He wants Peter to know, I'm not done with you. He wants Peter to know. In fact, he even testifies at the end of this passage about the kind of death that Peter would glorify God with. Instead of slinking away in shame, Peter would go on to preach one of the greatest sermons of all time where 3,000 souls were saved at one time. Wow. He would write two books of the New Testament. He would be one of the first to realize God's plan for the Gentiles. That they weren't unclean. That all, had, all ground at the cross was level ground. There was neither Jew nor Gentile, male or female, slave or free. And he'd fail again. He'd fail again. But when he returns, he would know the way back. Because he's experienced God forgiving him at the deepest, most broken, most radical failure of his life. It's the resurrected Jesus who offers redemption for failures. You see, a Jesus who did not rise from the dead, he has no hope to impart, no recovery to offer, no renewal to effect, and no restoration to provide. A Jesus that did not rise from the dead can not help you. He can't motivate you. He can't genuinely inspire you. He can't move you. If Jesus is not raised, Paul has said, we are pitiful at best. Because we're all failures, and because we've all failed, and so often and so extensively, we need to face our failures. We need to receive the forgiving grace of Jesus so that we can be remade. You see, so often we want things to change. We want to be radically transformed and become this new person, but we want to do it without having to face our failures, without having to own up to our sin, without having to take hold of 
the responsibility of our rebellion and realize it for what it is. See it for what it is. You see, we failed at relationships, friendships. We failed as church members. We failed at our marriages. We failed in our morality. We failed in our spirituality. We failed in our jobs. We failed at being a good neighbor. I mean, if I were to give you all a piece of paper and just ask you, in the last month, give me a description of the ways that you have failed, you'd probably be writing for a while. If you're a self-aware person and you actually evaluate the state of your own heart and the affairs of things in your life, you could write for a long time. And Jesus says, look at it. Look at it. Look at it. Now look at me. And realize that I forgive you for all of it. I forgive you for all of it. It's been cast as far as the east is from the west I've forgiven you and now I can remake you I can remake your marriage I can remake your relationships I can remake your identity in your neighborhood with the people that you've often offended And then Jesus says, basically, go walk in my love. He says, feed my sheep, tend my lambs. Go walk in my love, Peter. Go abide in me, Peter. Follow me, Peter. Follow him in your relationships. Follow him in your morality. Follow him in your friendships. So what is it that you're failing at this morning? What is it that you just, sent, you, you just can't seem to get together? You just can't seem to do right. What emotions can't you overcome? Believe this. Jesus was raised from the dead and he overcame that thing that you're failing at. Jesus dealt the death blow to the thing that you're failing at. The resurrected Jesus does something that we radically underestimate. Every time Jesus reveals himself after his resurrection, the net result of all of these different episodes is renewal and restoration. That's what he's always doing. I mean, a, person heart, a person's heart gets set afire again. Remember the two on the road to Emmaus? What did they say when they saw the risen Jesus? Were not our hearts aflame inside of us? Renewal was taking place. A renovating work of Jesus, the resurrected Lord, was effecting powerful change. You see, he, he imparts the power that generates Renewal and restoration. The renewal of hope, the renewal of purpose, the restoration of the broken down. That's what he's doing with Peter. He's ready to go back to the boat and just simply fish and be done with the rest of this. And Jesus generates a renewal of purpose in Peter's life. So that we don't identify Peter as the fisherman. We identify the man who sought to be faithful to his Lord all the way to the point where he was crucified upside down. Jesus raising from the natural, normal, regular hold of death was infinitely inspiring. The mental and emotional processes of the disciples are those same processes that had been radically and wholly ravaged by the fall in the Garden of Eden. People can't think right. They can't feel right. They can't relate to things the way that they should because sin and its radical um, hold on humanity was so extraordinary. And Jesus' resurrection power breaks the hold that the fall imposed on us. 
During the interval between Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection, the disciples had been crushed in every conceivable way. But when Jesus began to appear to the disciples, in the several times that he did, something began again in these men and in these women. Hope began to flicker and then it roared into a significant flame. Peter, seeing Jesus, threw himself out of a boat a hundred yards out in the sea. Peter's the one person that we would think would be ducking in the back of the group. And yet he's one that absolutely knows the only solution for the grief that's crushing him, the only solution for the guilt and shame that is going to strangle him to death is the man who's cooking fish on the bank. He's the only one. And he has to embrace and he has to own up to his failures, hearing his Lord ask him three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, more than all the rest, needed a resurrection for his own heart. And so when he saw Jesus, he was inspired, he was moved, he was overtaken. When you see the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, are you overtaken? Are you moved? Are you inspired? If not, it's not a fault in the resurrected Jesus. He's impressive enough to move us. It's the sin that's mounded itself up in our lives. It's the guilt and the shame from all of our failures that we can't seem to turn over and be done with. And so we wallow in these things, in our relationships, friendships, marriages, at our jobs, whatever it is, wherever we failed, wherever we have brokenness. We are so inclined by the normal and the natural to wallow in those things. Peter witnessed life in the flesh triumphing triumphing over the thing that couldn't be beaten. And his grief began to melt away. His guilt began to dissolve. His shame slinked away. And hope was renewed. Look at your failure. Look at it. Look at it. Now receive through faith in the resurrected Jesus the complete and radical forgiveness of it. If Jesus forgave Peter, he'll forgive you. His resurrection is so powerful a thing that it holistically affects the lives of those who follow him. He renews our minds. He reorders our affections. He he, he restores our will. Our mind, our will, and our emotions all get acted upon by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. A lot of you people are struggling to be something that you feel is beyond you. You don't feel like you can attain to it. In and of yourself, you absolutely cannot give up. If it's just you trying to accomplish the thing, give up. But if you are in Christ Jesus, press on. Because He is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Some of you are struggling to believe that the broken things in your life can be made whole again. You're struggling with having the necessary will to effect, or to effect lasting change in your life. But Jesus' resurrection is an emphatic, resolute, undefeatable triumph that extends to every part of your life. The Bible clearly teaches that if we are his, we are in him. You know, the one thing we will never fully grasp or really come to terms with until we stand before him in his presence of how significant that is. 
that we are in him. What being united with Christ signifies in every aspect of our lives. We'll never mind the depths of that, this side, of being with him. But we are in him, in his death, meaning that our sins have received their due penalty on the cross. We are in him, in his burial, meaning that our old life of unrepairable brokenness and failure has been sealed in the forgotten. We are in him in his resurrection. Meaning that a new, inextinguishable, inexhaustible life of change and growth has begun for us. The decay decay of our old processes and habits has been dealt its death blow. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives fresh hope for a new life. I'm going to read a few verses, and this will kind of begin to close with these few verses this morning. And I want you to think about these verses this morning as I read them, as you see them, I think, on the screen behind me. Think about the power that they speak of. Think about how that power, every ounce of it, derives from Jesus' exit of the tomb that morning. Take hold of these things. Cling t- tightly to them. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Paul says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Don't fear that your failures in broken places cannot be mended. Don't fear that they define you. They most certainly do not. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, Paul is praying that they may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. The word he uses for know, that they may know it. It's not that they might have intellectual knowledge of it, but that they might be joined through experience with this power. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul again is asking God that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being and then in verse 20 now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us the power is available to do more than you can even dream your relationships can be better than you even imagine so far as it's up to you For you to give yourself wholly to this kind of change according to the power that's at work in you. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 that we may know him and the power of his resurrection. Colossians 1.11 May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. 2 Peter 1 verse 3 His divine power has granted to us all Get this, all things that pertain to life and godliness. What things? All things. He has granted to us all things through his divine power. That means every tiny inroad into your life, every aspect, everything that you think is so out of the way and untouchable that nothing can reach it, he has provided the power for that thing to change. All of this through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. You see, the power to recover from failure is available. It's readily available. This is not, this is not a book of high-sounding platitudes that we write 
poems and songs about. This is a book that speaks of the actual, real-time life change that takes place in the life of those who would put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Who would look to him to deal with their failures. So how did Christ obtain, we'll close with this, how did Christ obtain this sort of power for us to live a new life? Well, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 4, it says, For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. It was through weakness that Christ achieved inexhaustible power. That's backwards, right? That's counterintuitive. That's an upside-down kind of ethic. And yet that's the way God's always been going about things in redemptive history. Jesus achieved this kind of power through giving power away so that power could be applied to the lives of of the powerless. To Jesus, or to Peter, Jesus spoke soul-defining words. Look at your sin, Peter. Look at your failure. Look at your brokenness. And now look at me. Everything else is gone. Let's pray.